Well, hello everyone. My name is Esra Hassan. In partnership with IFAM, I welcome everyone to the Osher Center for Integrative Health's Grand Round Series. Before I introduce our presenter for today, I have a few details about the format of today's presentation. There will be time at the end of the presentation for questions, um, and we ask that you go ahead and write your questions in the Q&A um, and not the chat, and we will answer them uh, after the presentation. Today's presenter is Dr. Alyssa Vela. Dr. Vela is a clinical health psychologist and board certified lifestyle medicine provider. She works with the cardiac behavioral medicine team at Northwestern's Blum Cardiovascular Institute and is a co-chair of the Department of Surgery, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Dr. Bella's presentation today will discuss the intersection between mental health and lifestyle medicine and how to leverage a lifestyle medicine approach to support mental health and psychological well-being. The presentation will also discuss how the emerging field of lifestyle medicine can support a shift toward mental health e equity. Welcome, Dr. Bella, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me and for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be here today and talking about this topic that uh, is near and dear to my heart, the intersection of lifestyle medicine and mental health and really thinking about how we can move towards health equity. So to start off, I have no relationships to disclose. I have included some aspects of my own identity here. Um, as a framework, these are some of my identities that I bring to this conversation today, as well as to all of my work as a clinician, scientist, and educator. So to start off, what is lifestyle medicine? Um, some of you might be familiar, some of you less so. So lifestyle medicine as a field is a relatively new subspecialty as compared to some other subspecialties. Though the practice or approach of lifestyle medicine has really been around for, for much, much longer. And there are other very much related disciplines from health psychology and behavioral medicine and public health that have been doing a lot of science and practice that very much falls under the realm of lifestyle. So I have a couple of definitions here, one from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine or ACLM. And then another from Egger and colleagues um, out of Australia. Australia has really been one of the leaders in the lifestyle medicine movement over the past couple of decades. But lifestyle medicine really focuses on not just treating chronic conditions, but also preventing primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention and disease reversal. The field really acknowledges that chronic diseases are the leading cause of, mor of morbidity and mortality and are really responsible for a large proportion of healthcare expenditure in the United States and worldwide. We also know from the science that many chronic conditions are preventable um, as are side effects of those conditions and that they are related to lifestyle and health behaviors. And that 80% of chronic conditions can potentially be avoided by addressing healthy lifestyle recommendations. What's also really important is that about 80% of the US population really wants to live in a better state of health to have better well being, but struggles to pursue it. So it's really emphasizing not just lifestyle, but how do we put some of these, these health behavior changes into effect. Um, lifestyle medicine in particular emphasizes these six pillars coming from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which are listed here, and I'll talk about a few of them today. So the vision of lifestyle medicine is again kind of emphasizing these six pillars, so thinking about eating, physical activity, sleep, stress reduction, and so on. Um, and really thinking about how can we leverage this emphasis as foundational to health, to again, prevention, treatment, and, and disease reversal in the context of the modern world that we live in. So how can we utilize these approaches in addition to kind of treatment as usual, but really thinking about our lifestyle, our health behaviors as foundational to helping people live their best lives. So this table is from Edgar and colleagues out of Australia. It's a little bit dated now, but I like how it sort of highlights some of the, the differences and approaches between conventional and lifestyle medicine as a field. And I've highlighted a few things that I think are particularly important. So the idea that the patient is really an active partner in care is central to lifestyle medicine. 
that treatment is is more long term. So instead of focusing on sort of those short term outcomes, but really focusing on the long term, knowing that we're talking about lifestyle, we're not talking about diet or something that's sort of um, short term or temporary, but really lifestyle uh, throughout the lifespan. Again, that medications and, and traditional care are very much important and can be used in adjunct in combination with these lifestyle approaches that we can leverage lifestyle medicine to think about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, and then taking things into the context of the environment. So, so these are just a few of sort of the differences as we, um, as the field of lifestyle medicine continues to grow and take a little bit of a different lens to health and well-being. So why lifestyle medicine now? Why are we talking about this? Um, so Edgar and colleagues really emphasized how about 60 to 70 percent of all primary care health visits in developed nations are related to lifestyle-based factors, lifestyle-based diseases. We also know that there have been substantial changes in the leading causes of morbidity and mortality over the past many decades from infectious diseases to chronic conditions such as heart disease and diabetes. Of course, with COVID, we saw some intersection of this, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the implications of COVID. Um, but we've really seen a, a very quick shift in what is impacting people's quality of life, their lifespans, and ultimately resulting in mortality. Uh, we also know that there's just a need to figure out how to shift how we manage these modern chronic diseases that are very much influenced by the modern world. And this approach really needs to bridge some of the gaps between public health and, and taking a more patient-centered, holistic approach to clinical practice. And that's where lifestyle medicine can really bridge some of these gaps and, and really emphasize quality of life for patients, for their families, and for communities as a whole. So you can see here a, a pretty recent graphic of age-adjusted death rates. And you can see some of the leading causes of death listed here. I'm sure none of these come as a surprise to anybody. Of course, COVID-19 is on here since this is relatively recent. Um, but as we think about these conditions and, and these conditions that we probably, most of us who are here spend a lot of time thinking about or even addressing directly through research or through clinical practice, where's the overlap with mental health? Is there any role? How does depression fit here? Anxiety? And so my hope today is to really make an argument for why we need to be thinking about mental health as inextricably linked to all of these conditions and how lifestyle medicine has a real opportunity as a, a relatively new and burgeoning subspecialty to address this intersection between mental health and um, these conditions and to really shift towards health, overall health equity, which would include mental health equity. So we know that despite a lot of strides in population health and increased life expectancy in the U.S. over the past decade, that chronic disease and disability continue to dominate U.S. health burden. This leads to poor quality of life, high health care use and cost, functional impairment, psychological distress, and premature death. An estimated one in five American adults have at least two of five major conditions, many of which are listed here. Cardiovascular disease, cancer, COPD, diabetes, arthritis. So these conditions are all related to those lifestyle factors that I mentioned earlier, such as smoking, physical activity, diet quality. Um, and all of these things are really connected to the quality of life that individuals, families, and society experiences. So again, it's all related, coming back to that question of where, where does mental health fit? Why am I bringing that up today as we think about lifestyle medicine and how that relates to health equity? So I'm really going to focus on some examples from my own work in cardiac behavioral medicine today, where my, my day in and day out is really focused on these intersections and the relationship between mental health and physical health in um, surgical recovery, in managing symptoms, in quality of life. So there's quite a bit of research on the relationship between depression, depressive symptoms, and major depressive disorder, and cardiovascular disease. Depression is recognized as a risk factor for the development of cardiovascular disease. In fact, there's a two-fold increase um, for those who have 
for the risk of cardiovascular disease. It's also a prognostic indicator for worse outcomes among those who already have a cardiovascular disease. Research has also shown that depression for those who have experienced an acute MI is associated with a threefold increase in mortality, as well as the fact that the relationship between depression and cardiovascular disease is reciprocal. So each of these is influencing or increasing the risk of the other. So this is a really good example of how mental and physical health are inextricably related. Recent investigations have also focused on this inner relationship of depression, stress, and cardiovascular disease and how that plays a role. And we have this model from Solano and colleagues in 2018 that looks at some of these biological and behavioral mechanisms that explain the relationship between depression, anxiety, and heart failure outcomes, which is very relevant to my work primarily with the advanced heart failure team at Northwestern. Um, arguably, there should probably be a, a bidirectional arrow between these biological and behavioral mechanisms as well. Um, but again, the idea is that all of these things are connected. So essentially what this model is outlining is that stress provokes the body's immune system to react by initiating a response to some of these outside irritants, much in the way that it does to other sort of intrusions such as bacteria. Um, and at the core of the immune response are white blood cells, um, that aid in communication to the immune system, but can also promote a chronic inflammatory state and ongoing cell damage. What's interesting as we think about the behavioral piece of this is that research also shows that physical activity can decrease cellular injury. So again, this is an example of how something like physical activity and an important aspect of lifestyle can influence this relationship between depression, anxiety, cardiovascular health, and particularly heart failure. So I have been using this diagram a lot since it came out a couple of months ago. Um, this is from the American Heart Association's new release of The Essential Eight, formerly The Simple Seven. And what I really like about this, and, and I know that some of the words at the top may be kind of small, so I encourage you to look this up if you're not familiar with it already, um, is that I think it does a really nice job of capturing how all of these things are interrelated and also really reinforcing that the science is to a place that a, a huge organization like the American Heart Association is not only acknowledging this, but putting this into really um, key and, and, and sort of seminal papers. So you can see here that at the top, we have psychological health, that we have life's essential eight, half of which are lifestyle health behaviors, such as diet and physical activity. And then we also have social determinants of health at the bottom. And all of these things are connected through this sort of infinity symbol, um, the, the line that has no end, because we really can't break up any of these aspects. And you can see at the top that psychological health can occur um, across a spectrum but still it intersects with this, uh, with this continuous line and all of these things coming together. And so I think this is really exciting that we're seeing um, you know, in general, this, this movement towards connecting physical health and mental health and, and hopefully breaking down some of these silos. And I, I really believe that's going to be essential for our efforts to promote health equity. So why mental health? I wanna give a little bit of background on the problem and sort of what's going on in terms of mental health. And then I'll connect this back to lifestyle medicine and some of the opportunities there. So as of 2015, pre-COVID, about 50 million Americans experienced a mental health disorder. So that is people who met criteria for a mental health condition. That is not accounting for any sort of subclinical symptoms, which are still incredibly impactful and relevant, particularly for folks who have other health conditions such as heart disease or, or um, diabetes, as an example. Um, this is about one in five US adults. So we're talking about a, a huge percentage of people, as well as about 30% of young adults. Mental health conditions or psychiatric conditions are also a leading cause of death for some age groups. It's the second and fourth leading causes of death for people ages 10 to 34 and 34 to 54 respectively. So particularly as we're looking at younger folks that are not necessarily dying at, as, at, at the same rates from heart disease, um, mental health conditions have a, have a huge impact. We also know that this is very expensive um, and that there are a lot of disparities in equities when it comes to mental health. 
for example, there was some research that looked at um, expenditure and deaths between 2016 and 2020, and they found that excess premature mental and behavioral health related deaths among indigenous populations and other historically marginalized groups was over 100,000 in the United States with a total excess cost burden of $278 billion. So this is really impacting the lives, the quality of lives of so many. What's also important to note, again, um, it's not just about those subclinical symptoms, is that even if we're talking about those who do meet clinical diagnostic criteria for a condition, many people are excluded from traditional sampling. Um, about 6 million are estimated to be excluded from traditional sampling. So that would include folks who are incarcerated, who reside in assisted living facilities or are unhoused. Now, of course, I, I couldn't talk about mental health without talking about the implications of COVID over the past few years. We have all lived through these past few years and, and certainly been impacted. So we have seen a huge impact on mental health in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen estimates of up to a 30% global increase in depression, up to an almost 30% global increase in anxiety. Um, and we're really seeing numbers in the, the mid to high 20 percentiles for, again, folks who are meeting clinical diagnostic criteria for conditions such as major depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder. Uh, the data that's been emerging is really showing that adolescents and young adults, women, and those with other medical conditions such as cardiovascular disease are the most affected from a mental health perspective that we're seeing a lot of this bi-directionality, this comorbid experience. But what's also important to note is that we were really seeing a rise in incidence of mental health conditions, even pre-COVID. So of course the world changed dramatically in 2020 and over the past couple of years since the onset of the pandemic, but we were really seeing some trends in terms of uptick of mental health even prior to that time and COVID only further accelerated that. What's quite interesting is that you know, I think one of the silver linings of COVID has been the increased attention to mental health, um, a little bit of reduction perhaps in, in some of the stigma, some of the um, willingness to talk about mental health as something that's important and impactful. So this is some pretty recent data that came from Ipsos, which is a, a, like a market research sort of um, organization. They collect data usually around the US, sometimes around the world. Um, and so they did a survey of Americans to get a sense of what did they think was, was important? What are their health concerns? And what they just published in September was that mental health has replaced COVID as the top health concern among Americans. So of course, we're seeing some shifts in, in COVID related restrictions and limitations and, and the, the world has sort of reemerged, particularly this year in a lot of ways. But we're really seeing that the effects of the pandemic, um, plus so many other things happening in the world, are continuing to impact mental health and will likely continue to do so at quite high rates for times to come. And, and people care about this. People are acknowledging this and think it's important. So when we think about mental health, it's also important to think about, well, well what do we do? do about that. And one of the big issues in the context of mental health is the fact that overall treatment seeking, engagement, and, and folks getting care is a huge problem. There's a lot of barriers to treatment, some of which I'll discuss in a few minutes. Um, certainly stigma, mental health stigma, health beliefs, cultural beliefs about mental health and treatment seeking play a huge role. Um, but unfortunately, this really results in less than half of people who would benefit from treatment actually seeking treatment. And of those who do seek treatment, about 25%, about a quarter, do not have their treatment needs met. So that's huge. People aren't able or are not interested in seeking treatment, and those who do a big proportion are not having their treatment needs met. What's also unfortunate, um, but very telling, is that these rates have not improved in recent years, in many years, actually. So we're seeing this long pattern of, of 
under treatment, under engagement in mental health treatment. And then of course, as an effect of the pandemic, we're also seeing even more um, access issues in terms of folks who take insurance, in terms of just number of providers. There are huge, huge, huge waiting lists for mental health providers, for psychiatrists, for psychologists, particularly those who are more subspecialized um, all over the country. And this continues to be a huge, huge issue. What's also important to know about this is that actually most, at least 50% of mental health is addressed in primary care settings by primary care physicians, not by specialty providers. So some of the challenges are in that connection and collaboration between those settings, um, can be challenges in training or just simply time, resources, all of those sorts of things. Um, but most people seek mental health treatment as a first line approach in a primary care setting, which I think further adds to the opportunity for lifestyle medicine, which is a, a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary specialty area um, to really expand the reach and opportunity to, uh, to address mental health by addressing access. So as we're thinking about health equity, um, you know, this is something, this is a title that has stuck with me since it came out um, earlier in the pandemic. This idea that racism, not race, drives inequity across the COVID-19 continuum. And this, um, this commentary really focused on, on more so physical health, but is certainly relatable uh, to, to mental health as well. So there are a lot of implications of this, this problem, um, this racism, not race, driving inequities across the COVID-19 continuum. And this has, again, been really exacerbated over the past few years. Uh, systemic mistrust, which is, which is incredibly valid, um, systemic and community level failures, again, access to care, uh, which is relevant for not just mental health, but for physical health. But we have to be thinking about things from a bigger picture level. Again, going back to that American Heart Association diagram that the social determinants of health and psychological factors are key drivers of those health behaviors and of those important outcomes for cardiovascular health as an example. So it's all related, it's all connected. And we have to be thinking about these things that are really intersectional way to, to drive change and move the needle. I also think it's important to acknowledge that it wasn't only COVID. When we're thinking about mental health and when we're thinking about um, some of these physical health outcomes, particularly over the past few years, COVID, you know, as an infectious disease was certainly not the only thing that impacted mental health and quality of life. So we saw huge upticks in discrimination, in bias, in lack of access. We saw Asian Americans being targeted, particularly earlier. Um, in the pandemic, but certainly, you know, throughout all of this time, the murder of, of so many from George Floyd to Breonna Taylor, terrorism, anti-Semitism, attacks on human rights, all of these are major stressors at individual, family, community, and societal levels, and they have really immense implications for both physical and mental health, because the, the implications are multifactorial. So mental health really sits at the intersection of so many different factors and, and really kind of going into this more extensively is beyond the scope of this presentation today. I'm just going to kind of hone in on a couple of these things. Um, we, we could spend a whole, a whole course talking about this, and I do for the clinical psych PhD students, and, and we still don't have time to talk about all of these factors. Um, but mental health is very much multifactorial as we're thinking about the intersections with social determinants of health with community, um, with these different aspects of life. Um, as a reminder, social determinants of health are really those conditions uh, in the places where people live, learn, work, play that affect health risks and outcomes. So I'm gonna kind of hone in on, on just a, a couple of these things here today. And I think one, one good example is that physical environment is really one of the, the most well-studied social determinants of health and has also been extensively studied with respect to mental health, to lifestyle um, and health behavior change. So for example, nature, um, time in nature, exposure to nature, but even looking as a, at a plant, so just you know, having a plant at home on your windowsill or in your office, can be really effective in reducing stress and distress. 
At the same time, you may have also heard about environmental racism. Um, it's something that, that actually comes up, I think, quite a bit on the news, on NPR um, in Chicago. And, um, and when we think about environmental racism, you think about some of the neighborhood factors that influence health and well-being. So there's research that has looked at the balance between access to green space versus cement. The idea being that areas that have been more affected by environmental racism are going to have a lot more cement, blacktop, um, pavement, that sort of thing, as opposed to green space. And yet we know that that, that can be um, a, a real trigger for worse mental health, for worse physical health, and that interventions that focus on green space, on nature, can be really effective. So there has been some work, for example, looking at community gardens as an intervention. So community gardens not only offer that access to nature, which can be incredibly uh, impactful for mental health, but can also encourage other aspects of lifestyle medicine that are so important, whether that's a more plant-based diet, that stress reduction, but also healthy social interactions, opportunities to connect with people in the neighborhood, with communities. So there's a lot of opportunity for thinking about how we can understand some of these intersections and begin to move the needle as we're trying to, to move towards mental and overall health equity. There's also numerous drivers of mental health inequity specifically. And again, I don't have time to get into all of these today by any means, nor is this an exhaustive list of some of these drivers. Uh, but there's really an immense body of research looking at mental health inequities, the drivers, the outcomes, and again, what the implications of this are. Um, so, I, so what I wanna highlight just briefly is this idea of isms. So we hear a lot about racism. There's many other isms from ageism to sizeism, heterosexism, classism, and then other um, sort of terms that, that follow suit such as xenophobia. So all of those sort of uh, bias, stigma, oppression that comes up in relation to various aspects of identity at an individual community and societal level. So one of the ones that, that comes up quite a bit working in healthcare, but I don't think is necessarily explicitly talked about a whole lot is sizeism. I think it's a, it's a, a good example of some of these implications that I'm talking about. So it's well documented that people on larger bodies have had many negative experiences and continue to have negative experiences with medical providers regarding their weight, their BMI, or their body size, and, and we won't get into kind of the, the details or history of, of BMI today, but that's certainly a factor as well. Um, and it's really well understood that a lot of those experiences result in bias and discrimination um, and can trigger systemic mistrust and even avoidance of the healthcare system. So for folks that have had negative experiences related to their body size, um, that, that discomfort, mistrust, um, you know, impact on their mental health can really influence their health behaviors, their engagement in preventative care, their engagement in follow-up care, um, because they, they don't feel comfortable and, and reasonably so. So as we're thinking about lifestyle medicine, I think it, it's important to think about how, again, how these things are intersecting and to what extent are some of these outcomes related to actual body size directly um, versus this discrimination that triggers or results in health behaviors because of this discomfort. I also just want to acknowledge whenever we talk about body size that it's important to acknowledge that it is not a proxy for health behaviors, that we can't tell what someone's diet or physical activity is from looking at them, um, but we really need to be thinking about intersectionality and how intersectional bias can really come to play uh, when it comes to race, ethnicity, gender identity, size, class, and how all of these can combine to exacerbate or perpetuate some of these drivers of inequity and have implications for lifestyle, health behaviors, and opportunity to really help support people to live their best lives. So again, there's really extensive research in this area of mental health inequities, and, and I'm just touching on a couple of things today. Um, but overall, we really know that racism, discrimination, acculturative stress, and trauma are only some of the factors that have been inextricably linked with mental health and well-being. That greater internalized racism and greater acculturative stress have both been associated with worse mental health. 
And I think it's important to acknowledge that bias and racism and all of these other isms, they don't discriminate. They influence physical health, they influence mental health, and they influence their intersection. So some, some fairly recent research looked at American adults' experiences with discrimination and found that almost 70% of American adults experience, report experiencing at least one episode of discrimination, but over 60% report daily discrimination. That's a pretty profound statistic. And discrimination has been positively associated with all sorts of outcomes, including depression, anxiety, psychological distress, and um, psychiatric disorders or mental health condition. So there's some research that has found that acute and chronic discrimination has been moderately associated with both one year and lifetime risk of any mental health or psychiatric condition even after adjusting for stressors and confounding effects. So the implications of this on mental and physical health are, are quite immense. And that the association between discrimination and mental health has actually been found to be stronger than that between um, discrimination and physical health. So there is an association um, across the board. So there was a study from Parodies and colleagues in 2015 that looked at data of 293 studies, predominantly in the U.S., and they found that racism was associated with poor mental health, again, including depression, anxiety, psychological distress, um, and that poor general and poor physical health. So the, the implications of this at a, at a bigger picture health level are immense. So this is just another diagram or model from the World Health Organization that's really focusing on some of the factors that can influence mental health of young people. And what I like about this is it sort of summarizes um, how mental health is influenced by so many different levels and so many different factors that are layered and that are intersecting from the individual level all the way to the societal level, from coping skills to social media. Um, and while this is focused on young people, I think this is actually really relevant to, to, adult, to all adults um, and adolescents. And so again, we have to be thinking about how all of these things are connected, thinking about that infinity sort of model, um, that as we think about moving towards health equity, we have to take, we have to sort of zoom out and take this bigger picture lens to connect all of these different aspects and how we can potentially intervene at a variety of levels. So what are the implications of this? There are many. What are the implications for over, overall health? Um, of course, as I've alluded to, there are, there are and can be certainly gaps of care as an effect of mental health inequities of bias, stigma, discrimination, so on and so forth. Um, there are immense implications for quality of life, huge economic burden, which falls onto the individual level, family level as well. There's also a lot of implications for health behavior change and for lifestyle interventions. And that sort of brings us back to this idea of lifestyle medicine and some of the opportunities. So research has found that depending on kind of how you look at it, that lifestyle factors can really account for up to 90% of chronic diseases or chronic health conditions. Um, again, that's thinking about kind of the non-medical factors with healthcare accounting for the other 10 to 20 percent. If we include genetics into this mix, uh, the research really suggests that we would attribute about 30 percent to genetics, about 50 percent to behavior, and then about um, 20 percent to that social and physical environment. So regardless of sort of how we're breaking this down, we can see that anywhere from 70 to 90 percent is lifestyle, is societal, is psychosocial. And so these these influences are incredibly important as we think about how can we actually help people to change their health behaviors in a way that helps them manage or prevent um, many of the conditions that we're treating um, as clinicians or addressing as researchers. So towards equity, again, that is, that is clearly one of the, the goals of this talk is thinking about, okay, there's been a lot of conversation about health equity, particularly in recent years with everything that has been going on in, in Chicago and the US and in the world. Um, 
But as we think about health equity, we have to be thinking about mental health equity as well. Ideally, uh, you know, in my mind, we would not even need to talk about mental health separately or mental health equity separately. Uh, we're certainly not quite there yet. Uh, mental health is is not kind of mainstream um, to the extent that that I would hope quite yet, but I think we're moving there. And, and part of moving the needle and addressing health equity and, and reducing health inequities, health disparities is to be really inclusive of mental health and to be sure that, that mental health is really central to, to this. So lifestyle medicine as a, as a field, as an approach, particularly those who are involved in ACLM has, has been a bit of a system disruptor. It's a different approach. Um, to care. I think folks are being really creative and taking on novel, novel approaches to drive change and to really um, help people meet their goals and live their best lives. And so I think there's an immense opportunity to leverage lifestyle medicine to shift towards overall health equity inclusive of mental health equity. Just a couple of definitions as, as we continue the conversation this afternoon. So this is from the 20. Uh, 22 Satcher report just from a few months ago. Um, and Dr. Satcher is one of the, the former US Surgeon Generals. So we have a couple of definitions here about health equity and then behavioral health equity, um, which overlaps with mental health equity. Um, and so again, really thinking about what, what does it mean to, to achieve health equity or to move towards health equity? And how does that, that right to access affordable, supportive care when it comes to mental and behavioral health fit within this overall definition. I think one of the first and important pieces is to really acknowledge that mental health is health. Again, in, in my dream world, we will move away from even um, separating these to the extent that we do, knowing that mental health is, is um, under the umbrella of brain health and the brain is a pretty darn important organ in the body. Um, but really thinking about that mind-body connection that I know so many of us have been interested in for so long, um, but we really can't be excluding the brain, can't be excluding mental health when we think about preventing, treating, and reversing those chronic conditions that are really impacting the lives of others. And I think this truly shows up every day in my work as a cardiac behavioral medicine psychologist that we have to be addressing the mental health simultaneously. Um, sometimes in recovery from heart transplant, for example, it's really the, the mental recovery that can be in a lot of ways more difficult than the physical recovery for some folks. Um, what I think is really interesting about this graphic, which came from the World Health Organization a few years ago, is that you can see that the tips for mental health on uh, surrounding this, this cute little brain are really pretty much the same things that we're recommending for physical health and, and for the most part, the same factors that are coming up within the lifestyle medicine space. So these health behaviors, what we're eating, how we're sleeping, our social support, our activity are just as important for mental health as they are for physical health. So lifestyle medicine for all, how do we use lifestyle medicine to really move the needle when it comes to health equity? So lifestyle medicine really does emphasize taking this whole person approach um, to, to, to moving towards health improvements and also improving patient satisfaction, which is related to provider satisfaction and provider quality of life. It's taking a person-centered focus um, to really accelerate kind of change and movement in terms of the outcomes that matter to whoever is receiving that care, to whoever is trying to make health behavior changes. So there are certainly already some amazing things that are happening out there in this space. Um, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine has a, a HEAL initiative, which is great. It's called Advancing Health Equity Through Lifestyle Medicine. That's what HEAL stands for. Uh, and they are really advocating for making lifestyle medicine more inclusive, for increasing access to training in lifestyle medicine, access to care. You know, one of the big challenges with any sort of new subspecialty is thinking about billing. And that certainly has trickle down effects for access, for, for affordability, that sort of thing. Um, so there's certainly room for growth and improvement, but, but this is a really exciting opportunity to very intentionally acknowledge these efforts. 
there was also a, a pretty new paper that came out of um, from this Institute of Advancing Health in partnership with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which uh, focuses on the potential of lifestyle medicine as a high value approach to address health equity. So again, you can see that there are some really important and exciting efforts to, to think about, okay, we have this sort of new and growing space, uh, people from all sorts of backgrounds, from registered dietitians to nurses, to physical therapists, um, to MDs and DOs, who are getting trained in lifestyle medicine and using lifestyle medicine in a variety of capacities, how can we leverage this growth and movement to address health equity? And my question is, how can we do that to make sure that, that mental health is included? So in terms of what's happening in a health equity sort of space or lens, I think what was exciting um, in preparing for this, I looked at the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. So again, that's only one journal, um, certainly not capturing everything. But there's actually already almost 50 articles just in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine that include a focus on health equity. And I've included just a few here to touch upon. Um, but they're certainly uh, not exhaustive. So Rook and colleagues in 2018 published about an optimal health and wellness clinic that was specifically seeking to advance health equity by providing lifestyle medicine services to their predominantly African-American population. Um, Dr. Rippey, who is the editor of the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine, wrote um, an article earlier this year that really gave a clear argument for why lifestyle medicine is even more important than ever in the context of COVID-19 related health disparities um, and, and kind of the, the future opportunities within that. Um, Krishna Wami and colleagues put out this really great paper in 2019 where they, they call for the implementation of a health equity framework within lifestyle medicine using what they call community engaged lifestyle medicine, which is an evidence-based participatory framework focused on addressing health disparities through lifestyle medicine. And this occurred within a, a residency training program in Texas. And then Pathic and colleagues also touch on lifestyle medicines for person, personal and planetary health. So again, thinking about that access to nature, about um, environmental racism, and as well as about the implications of um, changing planetary health on mental health. I know that's come up at a lot of conferences I've attended in the past couple of years. This is incredibly distressing for so many people. It really, um, there's a lot of environmental anxiety that people are experiencing. And so again, thinking about how can we use lifestyle medicine to, to address the planetary or, or climate crisis that is happening throughout um, throughout the world. So these are just a few examples of things that are, of, of work that has been done in recent years, looking at how lifestyle medicine can address overall health equity. Now, as I've indicated several times already, in my opinion, mental health is really at the, at the center of these pillars. As a practicing licensed clinical health psychologist, a lot of what I do is assessing and addressing these lifestyle factors, um, health behaviors, and how they intersect with mental health. Um, if, if I could add here, um, but I didn't for, for the slide to look nice, I, I would really imagine this with bi-directional arrows between mental health and each of these aspects of lifestyle medicine, that mental health influences physical activity, physical activity influences mental health, and so on um, and so forth. That mental health is really central to every single one of these, and I'm going to give a couple of examples here. So the first example is sleep. Um, and this is an example that of you know, why it's so important to address the mental health piece of things when we're thinking about addressing sleep from a lifestyle medicine perspective or really from any perspective. So we know that insufficient quality and quantity of sleep is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease as well as increased risk of depression. Um, and as mentioned earlier, these things tend to co-occur together and tend to uh, reinforce risk for one another. So a lot of the research that has looked at sleep um, sleep quality and quantity and, and outcomes has really found that rumination, which is that, that sort of thinking, 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 you can't turn your brain off when, you're, when your head hits the pillow at nighttime, is the key moderating factor in the relationship between sleep and um, many of these health outcomes. And so to me, that says that if we don't address 
the mental health factor, the psychological factor being rumination, then it's going to be pretty difficult to, to really address the, the implications of sleep to move beyond kind of the, the basic sleep behaviors or, or what has historically been sleep hygiene. If we want to reduce risk for depression, reduce risk for anxiety, improve mood, reduce irritability or distress, um, reduce risk for cardiovascular health, et cetera. So we have to be thinking about the, the mental health and psychological factors as a piece of the puzzle to really be most effective in seeing good outcomes. And, and of course, sleep has huge implications for quality of life. Another example I want to touch on is physical activity and the relationship of mental health um, from a lifestyle medicine perspective. So when we think about the, the relationship between each of those six pillars or, or domains that I mentioned earlier with mental health kind of at the, at the center, um, the, the relationship between physical activity and mental health has by far and away the strongest evidence at this point. Um, tons and tons of research has been done in this area, and physical activity interventions have really been proven effective for a whole host of conditions from reducing cardiometabolic risk factors to improving depression. Um, but when patients experience depression as a, a common symptom of depression is anhedonia, which is sort of that lack of get up and go, that lack of interest. So approaching physical activity interventions with this in mind for folks that are experiencing symptoms of depression or, or depressive disorder is really important. It can mean that we need to set smaller or more realistic goals, that we need to think about consistency over quantity, um, and that we have to be thinking about the, those intersections of physical and mental health to be really effective in using lifestyle approaches um, to address some of these outcomes, whether it's you know in the context of cardiovascular health and or depression. What's also really important about this is that what we see all the time, and, and I hear patients share this, is that you know when, when depression is a, is a piece of the puzzle or depressive symptoms, patients can feel like they're failing when they go see their primary care doctor or their cardiologist or someone else and are encouraged to exercise for their cardiac health, which would also be good for their mental health. They can feel like they're failing, like they're disappointing their providers, their families, because of the depression, the anhedonia that's really getting in the way. Um, so we have to address that concurrently to really help and support people to be able to make these sort of lifestyle changes in an effective and sustainable way to help their physical and mental health. Um, similarly, and, and what I have shown here is many folks who have heart failure, for example, or any sort of electrical cardiac condition that might require an ICD can experience what's called kinesiophobia. And kinesiophobia is fear of movement or re-injury, which you can see to the left of this model. It was coined by Miller and colleagues. Uh, into, in 1990 as an aspect of this fear avoidance model. And this is something that comes up for me really often in clinical practice. So it's a situation where patients can't just push themselves. They have very valid fears of movement. They're, maybe they get short of breath because they have heart failure, or maybe they've been shocked by their ICD before. And so we have to address the, the psychological component, um, their, their health beliefs, their expectations, the worry, the anxiety, the stress that is driving that kinesiophobia to really be able to move the needle on um, improving physical activity, which is really important for folks, especially who are gonna go through cardiac surgery, for example, and need to maintain conditioning. The last thing I'll say here in terms of this example is, um, you know, physical activity, again, is sort of uh, recommended for just about everything. It's certainly recommended for people with heart disease. Um, but we also know that most people with heart disease really struggle to, main, to engage in and maintain appropriate or, or kind of sufficient levels of physical activity to see the benefits. So there was a study um, about 10 years ago from Rogerson and colleagues, and they really, they interviewed patients, this is a qualitative study, and they really wanted to get at what are some of the barriers towards physical activity engagement. And the barriers really were negative perceptions towards health and lifestyle changes. Again, kind of that, that fear, that worry, perhaps kinesiophobia, having low mood and low motivation to exercise, feeling physically restricted or fearful of exercise, and lacking the knowledge regarding exercise um, and some of those external barriers. So most of these are psychosocial factors, things that have to be addressed to really be able to put some of these interventions into play and to help support both physical and mental health. 
So just the last few things um, before we wrap up and go to questions is that I think there's also really an opportunity here to think about how lifestyle medicine can support mental health and shift towards health equity across various levels. So I focused mostly on the individual level today um, as, a, as a clinician who does a lot of individual work, thinking about symptoms, um, how we're assessing for things, how we're talking to folks, education at an individual provider level as well, the language that we're using um, when talking about and with the folks that we're caring for, et cetera. But there's also so many opportunities and, and uh, areas for growth at the organizational level. Um, lifestyle medicine has really encouraged kind of exciting approaches such as um, cooking groups or culinary medicine, walking with a doc program, shared medical appointments. So, so kind of these more hands-on approaches at organizational uh, levels that can be really impactful for both physical and mental health and very much in alignment with the ethos of lifestyle medicine and certainly helping to, to reduce some inequities. And then at the community level, there's so much opportunity. And, and I think this is really an exciting opportunity for science as well. Um, but this idea of community engaged lifestyle medicine framework that I mentioned earlier um, as one of those studies that was published in 2019 is really thinking about how can we use this framework to emphasize community partnerships, expand where services are offered, quite literally meet people where they're at, such as hosting educational sessions at the grocery store about how you know, dietary patterns can impact physical and mental health or the relationship between cardiovascular disease and depression. Um, how can providing culturally responsive education and interventions that are usually using culturally concordant foods, language concordant offerings, uh, or partnering with faith-based faith -based organizations be really leveraged to, um, to apply some of these inter interventions at a, at a broader scale in a really thoughtful sort of way. So in conclusion, um, this is a quote from Dr. Satcher, former U.S. Surgeon General, there is no health without mental health. I, I hope I have made the argument today that mental health really does need to be central to this conversation and, and, and is also such an opportunity as lifestyle medicine continues to grow as we see this expansion of the utility of lifestyle medicine beyond um, public health and health psychology and, and behavioral science to medicine in general, that there's really an immense opportunity to take novel um, approaches to really meet people where they're at, provide um, holistic patient-centered care to, to address things at a community level and to truly um, support efforts to reduce inequities and to shift towards overall health equity inclusive of mental health. Um, so thank you so much, and I look forward to answering some questions. Thank you, Dr. Bella. We do have a couple of questions. Um, and the first question is, how do you see scaling lifestyle medicine for our health system? I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think this is sort of still being figured out, certainly. The first answer is always it comes to education, it comes to training. I think having opportunities to provide training, particularly at the medical student level, at the resident level, um, Northwestern's medical students have curriculum in lifestyle medicine from year one, which is amazing. And, and I think as we see that expand to other medical schools um, and residency programs around the country, I think that will make a huge deal. I think the more people that are are thinking about and, and advocating and have this experience to um, to then go to leadership and or become leadership and make changes will be really essential. Um, and, and then I think bigger picture, it's going to be ongoing advocacy, whether that's billing um, structures, interdisciplinary teams, you know, having behavioral scientists, psychologists, et cetera, on interdisciplinary teams to really serve as that expert and, and guidance. Um, but I, I think those are just a few of the, the many opportunities to continue to scale. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, how does a person get a lifestyle medicine physician on one's healthcare team? Also a good question um, that can be challenging to answer. So the American College of Lifestyle Medicine does have a tool where you can search for folks who are board certified in lifestyle medicine. Um, I think what's interesting about lifestyle medicine as a specialty, as a clinical psychologist myself, is that 
uh, you can become board certified, not just as a physician, but also as an allied health provider. So that is how I was able to pursue board certification. Um, so that's a good place to start. Um, and I think, I think what you'll find is that more and more people are, are pursuing this training and, and similar trainings and working in a variety of settings, not just lifestyle medicine clinics, but um, in traditional healthcare settings, private practice, et cetera. So that can be a really nice resource. And, and I think we'll continue to see growth in that area. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, first, I wanna thank you for talking about sizeism and that a thin body does not automatically imply a healthy body. I'm curious if you and your colleagues refer patients that would benefit from lifestyle medicine support to register dietitians for one-on-one -on -one medical nutrition therapy appointments. Also, what are your personal recommendations for vitamin D testing and supplementation? Yes, absolutely. I, I think um, involving experts, involving registered dietitians as, as much as possible is incredibly important. Um, I work with an interdisciplinary team that has registered dietitians as a part of it. Um, I know so many others do as well. So, so yes, I think that's incredibly important. And there are lifestyle medicine board certified registered dietitians out there as well, which is really exciting. Um, vitamin D testing, I cannot answer because that is not within the scope of my practice as a, as a health psychologist. So I will defer on that one. Thank you. Um, and the third question is, there are a lot of specialized physicians who are interested in or practice lifestyle medicine. If the role mm -hmm. for the primary care doctor is coordinating the other healthcare providers, what is the role for the subspecialists? I'm not sure I'm following that question. Um, okay, let's uh, go on to the next question. Has there been any discussion in your circles about the use of national board certified health and wellness coach to support both mental and physical health? Yeah, that's that has definitely come up, I think, within the lifestyle medicine space. Um, health and wellness coaches are, are a big movement. I think that the challenge and this question touched on it, is the certification. So unlike uh, medical specialties, coaches, there's no sort of like regulations when it comes to coaches. So really anybody can say they're a coach and can sort of put that out there into the world, onto the internet, that sort of thing. Um, I, I think that coaching is, a, is an incredible opportunity to increase access um, in partnership with other healthcare providers, I think there's just going to be some opportunity for sort of um, sort of figuring out that space because of the the lack of regulation. You don't have to become sort of licensed or certified necessarily to to work as a coach. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of attention to other types of medical providers, including physicians, learning coaching skills, getting coaching certifications, and really taking on that skill set. Um, as part of that practice. So I think both of those things are happening concurrently and I think there will be some, some ongoing, perhaps growing pains, but I, I think there's also really a lot of exciting opportunity to increase access. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Thank you for having me.